We're in Revelation chapter 5. Although Revelation chapter 5 was last week. We did the whole chapter in one week. Imagine that, how wild, 14 verses. But Jesus is the lion uh, of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the root of David. And Jesus is also the lamb who was slain and resurrected and stands uh, in the middle, in the center of the throne in heaven where God sits, God the Father sits. And he's the only one worthy to come and break the seal that was in the, the scroll that was in the hand, in the Father's hand. So he comes and he's worthy to break it and he comes and he takes the scroll and all worship breaks loose in heaven. Uh, he has worth and sovereign power and authority and he just takes the scroll. So here's what happens. He takes the scroll and in this worship service that happens there in heaven, they ascribe to Jesus every, every highest characteristic Power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. And that's where we ended last week in chapter 5. <clears throat> now I'm going to start chapter 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I just want to sort of say a few things. And I've said this before. Revelation is not an easy book to interpret. It is not. I'll read some of the, the commentaries, and I like them, all the ones I'm reading. And I enjoy them, and I have some favorite teachers that I look at. But I don't, sometimes don't know if anybody knows what they're talking about. Honestly, all of them. But you get to the book of Revelation, and it's nice to, re worth reminding ourselves at this point that the book of Revelation is much about the future, the end of the world, the end of time, the end of the earth. He says in Revelation 119, what will take place later? I'm going to show you what's going to take place later. Not now, not in the time that John lived, but something that's going to happen later. I believe he's talking about end times things, which I do believe that the book is about. And John begins to see things when he goes up into heaven and uh, standing there at the throne watching this worship service, watching the lamb who is worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. He sees that, and he sees things that are going to happen in the end of the world, the end of time, the end of the earth the tribulations that are going to come upon the world. So this, uh, the lamb comes and takes the scroll and begins to open the seals. And when he opens these seals, uh, this is also not easy to interpret. Are these seals things of uh, chronological sequence? One seal opens, that happens. The second seal opens, that happens. In a chronological way of looking at things, judgments that God is bringing on the earth happening one after another. Or... Maybe are they things that are happening sort of just unfolding as you go, but in a simultaneous sequence of things, a simultaneous course of events, not all one right after another, but all happening together, but it revealed one right after another. i just thinking about things like that, trying to understand the book of Revelation. Anyway, that's what I'm thinking anyway. I'm thinking it's all happening in a sequence of timing of events, but also perhaps, and maybe so, a simultaneous thing or an overlapping type of a thing. So that's where I'm going to go with this. Uh, several good commentators think these things are uh, uh, linked together in a sense where they're parallels with the things Jesus taught in Matthew 24 on the Olivet Discourse there, uh, things he's talking about in the end times. And I don't disagree. I'm not going to go and unpack all of it although I would like to go back and say some of the things that are happening in Matthew 24, and I will correlate as much of that as I can as we go through this. But this is what's going on in the book of Revelation, and I think it starts to get more and more difficult to teach because it's getting more difficult to understand. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. I'm going to get to some of this. And so I'm just going to deal with the first four seals tonight, if I get that far. The first four seals... Uh, are described as the four horsemen. Y'all have heard that term before? It's a very popular colloquial phrase. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was like an early 20th century Notre Dame football team had a four linemen that were called the four horsemen. They were invincible. They called them that because they were beasts. And then you had, when I was growing up in high school and middle school, there were, you had a, uh, these wrestlers, Arn Anderson, Ole Anderson, Ric Flair, the four horsemen, they were the four horsemen. Couldn't nobody, be, nobody could beat them, or at least that's what they were supposed to be. Nobody could beat them. Because you know that stuff's real. 
the four horsemen. Anyway, that term, four horsemen, comes from this text, this passage of Scripture. There's no reason to call anybody four horsemen anywhere in the world except that it came from this passage of Scripture, four horsemen. It became very popular culturally to say the four horsemen, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And whenever you hear the term four horsemen, you never hear the first horseman. You never hear the second horseman. You always hear four horsemen almost always together, the four horsemen, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So that's what I want to try to unfold here tonight with the time I have left. Revelation 6 verses 1 and 2 says, I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures saying a loud and a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, immediately, I'm struck with this ominous-sounding voice that one of the four, four, four living creatures, remember we looked at those people last week, four living creatures around the throne. One of them says, come, with a loud, uh, thunderous, rumbling-type voice. And it's as if um, each of the four creatures sort of waiting his turn to speak because these first four seals get opened, and each one of them says something. Each one of them says, come. And, you, it, and they don't read the text. The lamb doesn't grab the scroll, open it, and then start reading the text of what's in the text, the content of the scroll. It's just depicted in a dramatic fashion. He says, come, and he says, I saw this. So it's whatever the contents of the scroll are depicted for us to look at in metaphors and images and things that mean something. Now, one of these image is, the first image is uh, a white horse. He summons this white horse and its rider. And immediately I'm going, okay, uh, what does that mean? The white horse and his rider, the rider has a bow, which means some kind of um, um, weapon, a weapon type thing, military or something like that. He's got weapon power. He also has a crown, which means he has authority as a ruler. He rules. He determines how things are going to go because he has a crown. That's what a crown means. It's a ruler. And these things have been given to him. And uh, you have like four main views of what this, who this right, white horse and rider are. I'll just quickly give them to you. Some people think that this is Christ. This is Christ because in Matthew and, and Revelation 19, Verse 11, Christ, it's Christ on a white horse coming. But he has a sword out of his mouth then. So they think, well, they, Christ was on a white horse there and he's wearing a crown. This must be Christ now. And also the gospel does indeed spread over the whole globe. So this is Christ coming on this white horse and he's spreading the gospel all over the whole globe, bent on conquest. That's what that means. Or at least that's what one view is. I struggle with that one because Christ is the one who broke the seal. So is Christ the one coming to right after he broke the seal? I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not following it, but that's a, a valid view. Um, another view is some have identified this writer with some kind of a messianic type uh, flavored um, deceiver type, an antichrist. Some even actually say it's the antichrist. So this is a messianic flavored person coming with bent on conquest. Uh, so some people say that, and it correlates with what Jesus says in Matthew 24, that false Christ uh, will come and deceive many people, even deceive the elect if that were possible. That's the kind of thing. Some say that that's what this is. Uh, others say that this is, is indeed the Antichrist. Um, so... You're sitting there immediately just reading some commentators who you trust and who you like and you read their stuff and you go, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And then you go, no, I don't think that's right, that right or that right. Some, uh, my favorite says, um, actually it's not my favorite, it's my favorite. See that this is a, the horse and rider is only a principle. See the other three riders that follow the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse, they're not anybody at all. They're just principles or forces or powers or, um, you know, things that happen. So some see this as only a principle. 
the white horse and the white the rider, the white horse with the rider is just a principle that happens. Now I'm going, okay, maybe some of there's some elements of all all of these views kind of want to try to uh synchris synchro nailed it. Synchronize these things. <clears throat> um the Antichrist who does come, there is an antichrist coming, a man of lawlessness, described in First Thess- or Second Thessalonians, a man of lawlessness is going to come. Um, he will be a, indeed a false Messiah type, a false Christ. He will set himself up as God. He will set himself up as the one to be worshipped. And he will use intrigue and he will use deceit. He will use false miracles to, in fact, conquer the world, take over everything, Take over everyone. It's not going to be with war, but he will have um, weapons to threaten war. Now, honestly, I'm not really totally convinced of what I just said. I'm not completely sure about it, but that's the view I'm going to hold. The white horse and the rider is the Antichrist coming to take over the world. He's not going to use a war to do it. He's going to do it with sort of a, a peaceful intrigue. Uh, I just want to show you some of the, uh, one of the commentators I read is a guy named Kistemacher, William Kistemacher. Um, he writes, I have interpreted this power as the gospel that is going forth, conquering and to conquer. They, he believes that the white horse and the rider is the gospel. MacArthur, John MacArthur says, others identify the rider as Antichrist. So he's refuting that people call it the Antichrist. MacArthur's refuting that. But since the other three writers represent not individual persons but impersonal forces, war, famine, and death, it's best to view the first one as a force as well. So he views that this white horse with the white water is not anybody, just a force, a a principle, which is, he says that force is best defined as worldwide peace. So the first rider comes on a white horse and takes over the world but with peace. Uh, which is shattered during the second seal and the second rider. And then he says, however, Antichrist, as we will, as will be seen, will play a leading role in promoting this worldwide obsession with seeking peace. I'm going, okay, uh, I like MacArthur. He says some good stuff there. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm wanting to go with that one. I, I definitely don't think he's talking about the gospel that spreads because we are talking about end times things here. And then uh, this is actually my favorite commentator, uh, Thomas Schreiner. He writes, I support the minority reading. This is his view. That sees the white horse as representing Jesus Christ and the progress of the gospel throughout the world. So he sees the white horse and the rider as Jesus. I'm going, huh? How was that? Well, that's that's a view. Who knows? It doesn't say it in the text. We're just making up stuff to believe about the text and we haven't even looked at the text yet. That kind of thing, you know. I'm going to go, okay, does anyone have a consensus interpretation? Does anyone really know what it means? I'm going to go with the principle or I'm going to go with the one that says uh, the, the writer is a powerful person who has weapons of war and he takes over the world but not necessarily with war but rather with the diplomacy politics and just determination he's bent on conquest and so he does whatever he has to do to bring and i do i don't disagree that it's world peace he's going to bring this peace to the world and it's going to be through politics and um i didn't put it in my notes but daniel says he'll be a man of intrigue like he has a way of just sucking you in with his charms and his charisma and he gets you to believe him and he takes over the world. And he does have weapons, but he doesn't have to use them right now. Peace is much easier to deal with than war. Peace is a, a less messy proposition. And of course, I read this a while ago. MacArthur views the horseman as a force of peace for the world and the Antichrist playing a leading role in promoting that obsession, that worldwide obsession while seeking peace. Now, it will be a peace for sure, but it won't last. It'll be a false peace. Um, that's what I tend to want to think, although I admit that I'm feeling uncertain about it a little bit. Uh, but that's just the view I'm holding to. This is the, 
the Antichrist bent on conquest of the world and he's gonna do it with peace. He's not coming with war yet. He's coming with peace. He has war if he wants to. He has weapons. He has a bow to threaten you with war if you don't listen to him. But that's not what he's here. And let me highlight this point too. Before I do that, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 says, people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them. We're talking about the end of the world. End of the world. One of the things that's gonna be highlighted at the end of the world is everyone's crying out peace and safety. Peace, peace, peace. Look at all the peace we got. It's gonna be wonderful. Peace. Then all of a sudden it's not. And then Matthew 27, Jesus, Matthew 24 uh, one of the correlations, one of the parallels, Jesus says, as was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, in the days of Noah, there was violence in the earth. It's one of the things that grieved God's heart was violence everywhere. It says, for in the days of Noah, days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark which means eating and drinking and getting married and just having your family and having your kids and enjoying your life means it was pretty, except for the, the Nephilim fellows that would cut your head off if you looked at them wrong, everybody was having a good time getting along with each other, eating and drinking, being married, having kids, getting all that stuff. Peace, up just like that. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man in the last days at the very end of the world before Jesus comes back, just like that, which sounds pretty peaceful to me. Eating and drinking, giving in marriage, and giving away, giving in marriage. But I want to highlight this too. This, this white rider, this rider on the white horse is given a crown. He has a crown, but the crown that he has to rule with, the crown that he has to take over and to conquer and conquest was given to him. He has this crown that was given to him. By the way, the word crown is the Greek word Stephanos. We get Stephen from it. It means crown. That's your name. If your name's Steve, it means crown. There it is. But I just want to say there's no authority given, there's no authority on earth that anybody has, even the Antichrist. Even Satan, nobody has any authority except what God gave them. That's what Jesus said to Pilate. You wouldn't have any authority over me if it weren't given to you, granted to you from, from above. This Antichrist has power to rule because of this crown that he's wearing. He is indeed, uh, he does have authority, but it's not his own authority, and he doesn't come up with that on his own. He is given to him. He can't do anything apart from the sovereign will of God. God has given him this crown to rule. And whatever he does with it, God let him have, let him have authority to do it. It was given to him. For God's purpose is on the earth to happen. That's what the scroll is all about. God's purpose for judging the earth. He's going to let the Antichrist have a crown and rule. He's going to have this purpose on the earth for this peaceful conquest of the whole world. So then you get the second one here, verse uh, 3. And for when the lamb opened the second seal, anyway, that's, that's my view of the first seal. The white, rider on, the white horse with a rider. Bent on conquest, going to take over the world, but not with war, but with just determination and peace. But now the second seal, uh, I heard the second living creature say, come, same as the first. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power. There it is again. He was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Now this seems a little bit easier to, to interpret because it gives us clues in the text what he means. This rider was given power by God, again, by the sovereign hand of God. This rider, this principle that was given power to snatch peace away from the earth. The first Horse and the first rider brings peace in the earth and conquers the earth, but the second rider takes it away. So whatever peace the first horse, horseman achieved, it's gone now. So I'm going to interpret this. I believe this is geopolitical war. War, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, man against man. 
And it's got all the finest and the latest weapon technology in it too. It doesn't say that in the text, but if we're going to read it in the 21st century, I've got to imagine there's an uh, M1 Abrams battle tank out there somewhere. And there's an F-16 out there flying with it too, dropping bombs. Probably some kind of uh, interpersonal violence too, gang warfare, warlords, just pri- their own little private war with the tribe next door. That stuff's going on too. Small skirmishes, large-scale warfare. Like I said, probably involving some fighter bombers, some tanks, and some ships. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So the red rider, the red horse and the rider who takes away peace, violence and bloodshed will be the hallmark of the red horseman. He comes to make war. He comes to bring war. He comes to ruin everybody's day. He was given power to take peace. Not on his own, but he was giving it to him. God gave him this power. God is sovereign and uh, has ordained all this slaying that's going to happen. This men's going to kill each other with this large sword that means war as a key element for his plan for the end of the earth. Uh, there's a few other places, but Zechariah 14, talking also about the end of the earth, Zechariah 14, is a prophetic book about the last days. On that day, men will be stricken by the Lord with a great panic. Each man will seize his, the hand of another and they will attack each other. It's just to be violence on the earth. Panic, fear, anxiety, stress, war. And I also want to point out that I believe that Antichrist will be a major player in all that violence too. Not only is he a man of intrigue and brings world peace and everyone's going on peace and safety, he's also got another uh, plan up his sleeve to kill people. The world do the fine trick. The world do that trick well. Verse uh, 5 and 6. Then the lamb opened the third seal and I heard a third living creature say, Come. I looked and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand and I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. Again, another seal that's open and it seems a little bit easier to interpret because it tells us some things. Some of the details, less difficult to explain. Scales are for weighing Measuring. Scales are for uh, weighing weights and volumes. So this writer comes out to weigh volumes and amounts of food. That's what this is going on here. And I, I like this too, just a quick detail. John doesn't say it's one of the voices of the four living creatures. The four living creatures says come, but another voice is heard among the four living creatures saying this. Not one of them, but only a voice saying it. And this voice starts announcing the latest market prices for food in what appears to be, and what seems to be, what I think it probably is, a famine. Famines are happening in the earth. And when famines are happening in the earth, food gets scarce. The economic principle of supply and demand is in play. The price of food will really start to surge here. You know, I wanted to say this real quick. This is a side note. This has nothing to do with anything. I get annoyed when I watch my YouTube channels and it says, doesn't matter what the, it doesn't matter what the news is. They say this word surge. Trump's poll numbers surge. And then you look at it and it went up like a half a percent. No, surge would mean to be like 100%. It surged. Anyway, this... Food prices really will surge because of the scarcity of the produce that we're trying to measure the weight for. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 7, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Famines on the earth make food scarce. And when food's scarce, the price goes up. Now today, you can, it depends on where you go. Uh, go to McDonald's, a Happy Meal is between 4 and $8, depending on where you live. I think California is more than it is here, right? $8 in California, $4 here. 
But on that day, when the black when the horse the, the black horse with the rider with the scale shows up, uh, it's going to be. And it says five hundred dollars. It's not going to be. It'll probably be somewhere between fifty and a hundred dollars for a happy meal. You follow me? The word is denarius. It's a day's wage. So depending on where you work and how much money you make in a day, it could be anywhere from fifty to a hundred dollars. That's how much it's going to cost you just to get a happy meal. Now, what's that inflation rate? That's a surge. Um, it's a severe inflation rate. Then you add on top of that, the, first, the second rider of the wars, imagine all the armies marching through eating all the food. So it's already a famine, and then it's scarcity because bombs are blowing up stuff. Agent Orange is being spread everywhere, and the crops are dying, and the, the armies that do survive eat it all. Bad news economically in the country, wherever it is. An economic collapse, and it's going to impact the poorer classes of people mo most. The reason why I believe that is because it says the oil and the wine, leave those things alone. You know, while oil and wine are definitely commodities for cooking with, those were things that um, people who had more wealth could afford and enjoy more. So leave those things alone. So I'm going to interpret that as these were uh, the rich people, the wealthy people are not as severely affected by the inflation as the poor people, which is the way it always is anyway, right? If you're rich, you can absorb some of that more, and they do. But the economy is going to get really, really bad. In the end of the world, the end times, peace, peace and safety, war, and uh, economic collapse. That's what's going to happen. Then verse 7 and 8. I'm going to finish this, y'all. When the, when the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind it. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. The four, fourth horseman rode on a pale horse. and the, It's interesting, the Greek word is chloros. You get chlorophyll from it, which is green. It's like a pale green color, pale ghoulish, uh, gnarly looking animal, gnarly looking horse. And here the rider has a name. This is the only of the horsemen that has a name. His name is Death. So you immediately go, well, that don't sound good. And Hades is right there with him, following him along with Death. Hades was the place of the realm of the dead, and I'm not going to, uh, go into any interpretation of Hades and Sheol. It's from the Greek Sheol, translated into Greek, from the Hebrew Sheol, translated into Greek. Hades, it just simply means the realm of the dead, the place of the dead. And again, this rider on this horse was also given power, again by God, who works out everything in according to the purpose of his will, Ephesians 1.11. He works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. He gives power to the pale horse and rider to do something terrible. They virtually, they have power to kill 25% of the population of the world. And they have a, I said limitless, but just they have a lot of means to do that with too. Violence and war with the sword, famine and plague. Uh, I suppose you have things like major pandemics and viruses, part of that plague. You have starvation and disease, part of that plague. Pestilence and bugs and insects, part of that plague. Wild beasts, like infestation. Imagine going outside your house. This is in the south now. You won't have this anywhere else. You walk inside your house and there's like a 30 copperheads on your back porch. Right, Lisa? You see, you see one yellow snake and you want to scream. Imagine deadly animals or um, just wild animals that go crazy and just come out, of the wild, come out of the wilderness and come into the city. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, that stuff. And they come killing people. War, violence, 
pestilence, famine, plague, uh, pandemic, all those things, starvation. That's a lot of people that are going to die on the earth. Get used to people dying. Get used to it. There's going to be a lot of death. You'll be wishing for COVID to come back. What was the death rate for COVID? Like 0.03%. Your chances are you were going to get COVID and die. 0.03%, something like that. I think it was like if you were over 80, it was 14%. If you were over 70, it was another 6%. It got down to where if you were in for a zero to nine years old, you weren't going to die at all. It's like small numbers of people, yet yeah, we had a whole panic in our society and the whole world over this thing. So here you got this guy, these, this writer is going to come and kill a lot of people. I, did, I looked this up just today. As of today, there are about 8.2 billion people on planet Earth. As of today, there's a clock. You can watch it. So how many people are being born every second? 8.1 nine, I forget how many it was. It was, it was a lot of people, 8.2 billion, I rounded it up. A pale horse and his rider are going to come and they're going to take out a little bit over 2 billion of them. 2 billion people are going to die. You'll be like, where was the good old days when we had COVID? And only a few hundred thousand people died. Maybe a million, maybe a couple of million. This is 2 billion. That many people on earth will die when the, when the rise of the pale horseman shows up. That's like almost the whole population of China and the United States. A fourth of the earth, a quarter of the earth. That's big time. This is what's going to happen at the four seals, the first four seals. Peace, war, famine, economic collapse, and just killing lots of death by all kinds of ways. Now, this is how the end of the world starts. I believe this is talking about the end of the world. This is what's going to happen. The lamb begins to open the seals of the, of the scroll, and all these judgments are starting to be revealed. That's what's happening. Now, you have a lot of solid interpreters uh, who say that these seals or judgments of God are going to happen in the tribulation period, which is the gist of what Revelation, I think, is about, the majority of it, not, not all of it. And I'm not totally sure myself on all that interpretation. I just believe it's probably dealing with the gist of the, of the tribulation period. And that kicks off in this chapter right here. Some of those solid interpreters say that the tribulation is initiated by the rapture of the church. The church is going to be raptured up and the tribulation is going to start. I'm not certain about that one either. Other fine interpreters say, and this is a Shriner, the guy I like the most, says this. He writes, dispensational writers tend to locate the breaking of the seals to the period of the time after the rapture, limiting what happens here to the last seven years of history before the coming of Christ. So a lot of interpreters, he claims dispensational uh, interpreters say that this is going to happen in the last seven years of the history of the earth. And he goes, but John never mentions the rapture. And there's, he, this is what Shriner says. John never mentions the rapture, and there's no compelling evidence for limiting the seals to the last seven years of history. Now, that's my favorite writer says that, and I don't agree with him. I don't. I don't. He says, this, thus it is more natural to say that the seals cover the entire period from Christ's resurrection until his return. So he says the seven seals are about what happens after Jesus died and rose from the dead, all the, then to the end of the world. Like the whole Christian era. Dude, come on, man. <laughs> and I, This is the book I like to read the most, I'm telling you. And you're going, no. And so uh, I want to say that for this principle, the thing I said the first. See, these are solid interpreters, solid Bible scholars, Christian men who love the Lord and serve him and teach his word and preach his word, saying things like this, and you go, see, this book is not easy to interpret. This book is difficult to interpret. 
Now, I do believe that the seals portray events that are nearer to the final days on the earth than just all of church history. I don't believe that. I disagree with him on that. And there's, these things are, and the final days of earth's history are marked by the rise of the Antichrist. That's what's going to happen. That's what it says in Revelation, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll, we'll start to know this is going to happen when the Antichrist comes to power. So anyway, that's all I got for you tonight. I've gone a little bit long. Forgive me. I'll try not to do that anymore. Let's, let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. Thank you that you've given us this book, which you said will bless us. If we're blessed as he reads the words of this book. So I do thank you for giving it to us. I do uh, confess it's not easy to understand. I don't know everything that says, but I do thank you that you're teaching us what's going to happen at the end. All these things are going to happen. This is your plan. This is your will. You will be glorified in all of these things, even if it's difficult, which it will be. Teach us, Father. I pray you'd show us Jesus Christ. Let us look to him. Be saved. Call on him. Cry out to him for mercy. Be forgiven of all our sins. Father, I pray you'll bless the rest of our evening. Uh, Give us safety as we go home. Um, Use us this week that we would glorify you with our lives. We would share Christ with somebody. We would um, help someone. We would serve. And Jesus would be glorified in us. Bring us back together again Sunday so we can worship you in spirit and truth with your people all together here. And we can hear your word in 2 Corinthians. And we can just uh, enjoy a fellowship luncheon on Sunday. Thank you for that. Let's pray, God, you'll uh, be glorified in us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.